Hello everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Almost all the shows that you hear on this channel were produced around 60 to 90 years ago. It was a different time and a different era. Stereotypical portrayals and comments were the norm back then. Many old time radio shows contained some material that today some would find objectable in some fashion. This is history and this was the way it was. We learn from our mistakes and we move forward every time the sun comes up. The shows contained here are not only for the historical content they may contain, but for entertainment. What some may find offensive, others will not. If you find you are easily triggered by stereotypical portrayals or comments, I suggest you immediately stop listening, unsubscribe, and find other avenues of entertainment. Unless the platforms that I have these shows uploaded to mandate they be removed, they will stay. Please enjoy the following show. Danger, Dr. Danfield. The human mind is like a cave. Beyond the light, there are dark passageways and mysterious processes. I, Dr. Daniel Danfield, have explored those unknown retreats and know their secrets. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Danfield, authority on crime psychology, has an unhappy faculty for getting himself mixed up in hazardous predicaments because of his astonishing revelations regarding the workings of the criminal mind. As our story opens, we find Dr. Danfield in his office dictating to his pretty young secretary, Rusty Fairfax. Period paragraph. And, uh, and naturally, I was glad to avail myself of the opportunity and excitement of studying a criminal mind when the criminal believed that he was completely free from suspicion. It was four weeks ago today that my secretary, Miss Fairfax, arrived five minutes late for work. Good morning, Miss Fairfax. Is that uh, package for me? The postman just gave it to me. Mind if I open it? Oh, why not, Miss Fairfax? Does the return address indicate from whom it was sent? There isn't any return address. No. <laughs> well, in that event, we'll open... Is there something wrong, Miss Fairfax? There certainly is something wrong. Look. Why, George? The package seems to contain some excellent samples of United States currency. It sure does. They're thousand dollar bills. How many are there? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten thousand dollars. Hmm. Dan, who do you suppose sent them and why? Well, possibly some counterfeiter wanted me to see an example of his work. These bills aren't counterfeit. Wait a minute. Here's a note addressed to you. Dean, let me have it, Miss Fairfax. Probably it contains the answer to the riddle. Wow. They're extraordinary. Well, what does it say? Say? Oh, here. I'll read it to you, Miss Fairfax. Danfield, be smart and forget where you were on August 31st. Most unusual. Who signed it? There's no signature, Miss Fairfax. Well... Well, what? Where were you on August 31st? Don't be ridiculous, Miss Fairfax. I haven't the faintest idea where I was on August 31st. Have you? Of course. Where were you? With you. Let's not be facetious, Miss Fairfax. The fact that someone has mailed me this money is highly significant. Now, let me see. Dan, I know. No, no what, Miss Fairfax? August 31st was the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. You didn't give your usual lecture at the university, and I went up to Connecticut to visit my folks. That's right, Miss Fairfax, and that proves you're wrong, doesn't it? You weren't with me, after all. As a matter of fact, no one was with me. I spent the day... By George! Think of something? Indeed I have, Miss Fairfax. There was a telephone call from a man named... Uh... Oh, what was his name? Are you asking me? Yes, you see, it's very important. Perhaps that's your mysterious friend calling again. I doubt it. Hello, Danfield speaking. Oh, yes, Captain Otis. Captain Otis. That means another case, I suppose. Yes, Captain? I see. Well, what's unusual about the circumstances? Indeed. What's the gentleman's name? Norman My Miles. That's it. That's the man's name. What? Oh, yes, yes. I know you just said it was. I'm sorry, Captain. Yes, indeed I will. Miss Fairfax and I will be out to the Miles home in less than an hour. Goodbye. Well, what's it all about? A gentleman named Norman Miles was found dead in his bed this morning. He was murdered, Miss Fairfax. What's that got to do with us? It was Norman Miles who called me on the phone August 31st and asked me to investigate three relatives. 
one of whom he believed was planning to murder him. But you're not a detective. You've said so a hundred times. But I suppose you've got to have your fun. Yes, you're quite right, Miss Fairfax. That's why I kept Mr. Miles Offer in the back of my mind. And the details that Captain Otis has just given me have put an entirely different light on the matter. Oh, they have. Well, whatever Captain Otis told you doesn't prove it was Norman Miles who sent you this money. I think it does, Miss Fairfax. In fact, I know it does. Norman Miles knew he was going to be murdered. He wants me to apprehend the man who murdered him. I seriously doubt that statement. Oh, then I shall prove it to you. You get your notebook and come along with me. I'll introduce you to one of the most interesting cases we've ever investigated. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Danger Dr. Danfield, but first... Now for the second act of... Danger Dr. Danfield. I still think we should have Mario along. Do you, Miss Fairfax? Yes. If all three of the relatives are at the Norman Miles house now, and one of them is a murderer, we need protection. That's certainly extraordinary. Dan, what are you thinking about? Things, Rusty, just things. Yes, I believe we're going to find an unusual situation. I hope you brought along your notebook. Of course I brought my notebook. Is this the house? Yes, and uh, there's an officer on guard at the door. Otis is the man of his word. I don't see why Captain Otis has to call you every time he gets himself in a jam. Captain Otis is not in a jam, my dear. It was very kind of him to give me this opportunity. Hello, officer. I'm Dr. Danfield. Oh, okay, Jack. We'll go on in there waiting for you. Thank you. Well, I should judge by the pretentiousness of Mr. Miles' home that he was well able to advance us $10,000, wouldn't you, Rusty? And for the same reason, I can see why his relatives would want him dead. Well, there they are. Yes, and by their expressions, I should say they were a rather unhappy trio. I suppose you're Danfield. Now, look here, Danfield. We're sick and tired of the way we're being treated. I'll say we are. Who does this Captain Otis think he is? Anyhow? No, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you two. Perhaps this isn't Danfield. Give the guy a chance to introduce himself. Thank you. Yes, I'm Danfield. Now, suppose you tell me who you are. If you're Danfield, then get us out of here. Why, I was never so humiliated oh, in my... shut up, Judith. Stop crabbing. I couldn't let us out of here even if he wanted to. There are cops all over the place. You're quite right. I have absolutely no authority. Oh, this is my secretary, Miss Fairfax. I presume that uh, you three are Norman Miles' relatives? That's right. I'm Vincent Warren. The old man was my uncle. I'm Larry Kent, another nephew. This young lady is Judith Nelson, a niece. The idea of saying one of us murdered Uncle Norman. One of you did murder him, Miss Nelson. What do you mean? Nonsense. You're jumping to conclusions pretty fast, aren't you, Danfield? Not at all. One of you three murdered him. All of my evidence points to that fact. What evidence? You haven't been here five minutes. How could you have picked up any evidence? It came by mail. Ten thousand dollars worth. That's enough, Miss Fairfax. For the time being, I'll have to ask you people to accept my statement and cooperate. Cooperate? <laughs> How, by signing a confession? I could hardly hope for that, Miss Nelson. In fact, I'd be disappointed if one of you did sign a confession. Why? Because my purpose in being here is to study the guilty person's mind while he or she believes himself or herself free from detection. You mean that merely by talking with the three of us, you can tell which one of us is guilty? Assuming, of course, that one of us is guilty? Precisely, Mr. Warren. Consider the facts. One of you is a murderer. To a man who has made a lifelong study of the human mind, it will be quite easy to determine the identity of the guilty party. Well, how do you like that? Well, wait a minute now. I always say every man to his own profession. Danfield, I understand, has one of those mixed master minds. Maybe his idea works. Okay, what difference does it make? You haven't any alternative anyhow. That's the point exactly, Mr. Warren. You haven't. I merely wanted to point out to you that I know one of you is guilty. You're all fairly warned. Well, what do you want us to do? First of all, I'd like to have someone tell me exactly what happened last night. I understand that uh, when Mr. Miles' body was discovered, all the doors and windows of his room were locked on the inside. Yes, that's right, they were. Uncle Norman had a phobia against an unlocked door or window. Couldn't go to sleep unless he had checked all the locks himself. Then how did you know he got into the room this morning? By breaking the door down. Well, why did he do that? Well, Uncle Norman was a victim of habit. He did everything by the clock. Went to bed, got up, ate meals, everything. I see. This morning he didn't appear at breakfast at the regular hour. Yes, that's it. We'd all come down to breakfast and we're sitting waiting. 
<sighs> Judith, you have to keep yawning. You're making me sleepy. Oh, sorry, darling. I can't help it. I'm not used to getting up in the middle of the night. Neither am I. Sometimes I wonder if all this is worth it. Well, it's worth it to me. The way things are going in my business, I could use one-third of a million bucks very nicely. Well, who couldn't? That's what I tell myself every time I'm ordered down here for a weekend. Finney, I say, one-third of a cool million dollars is a lot of dough. Quit beefing and go earn your money. Well, what killed me is that he picked a weekend order to come and see him. I had a party planned up in the mountains. Oh, well, it's worth it, I guess. <laughs> sure it is. Uncle Norman can't live forever. I'm beginning to doubt that. How old is he, anyhow? Seventy-three, his last birthday. <laughs> Say, wouldn't it be a joke on us if he left his daughter a home for stunted ducks or something? No, 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 he wouldn't do that. He's told us enough times that we're his kids. Say, what time is it, anyway? Time? All right. 8.15, why? Why? Uncle Norman would die rather than be late for breakfast. He told us last night that breakfast was to be at 7.45. Well, maybe he did die in his sleep. Oh, well, why worry about it? He'll be alive. I think one of us ought to go up and see if he's all right. What good would it do? He always keeps his doors locked. Oh, we could wake him up by knocking. Are you kidding? Uncle Norman wouldn't wake up if a bomb exploded <laughs> under his bed. He's that dead. And I think Judith's right. We ought to do something. I'll go up. No, wait a minute. We'll all go. What's the matter, darling? Afraid to let me have a few minutes alone, my dear uncle? You bet I am, you little sneak. I don't trust you as far as I can throw an anvil. Why, you rat! Oh, just... quit it, you two. Let's get going. You know how Uncle Norman feels about us quarreling. Now, come on. The least we can do is respect his wishes while we're in his house. Oh, don't set yourself up as a model, Larry. You're no paragon. Well, at least I've got the decent... Oh, leader. cut it out. We're all putting on an act, so why not lay off till we get away from here? You started it. Now, here's Uncle Norman's room. Now, shut up, both of you. Listen to that guy, will you? Try it again, Larry, and loud it. Uncle Norman! Uncle Norman! Hey, do you suppose something's happened to the old boy? He's not that deaf. What are we going to do? We've got to do something. Try the knob. That's locked. He always locks his door. He's had another heart attack. I just knew he had. Uncle Norman! Uncle Norman! Well, we'll never hear you. Well, what are we going to do? Well, why don't you force the door? We've got to find out what's wrong. Well, raise the old Harry if nothing's wrong. Well, we can't just stand around here all day waiting for him to wake up. Something's happened to him or he'd be awake before now. Come on, Jenny, put your shoulder to the door. Well, okay, only don't forget it's your idea. Yeah. <laughs> Once more now. Uh, give me my... Yeah, that does it. Come on. Oh, thank heavens. There's Uncle Norman in bed, sound asleep. Now open the window, someone. It's hot as blazes in here. I'll do it. Hey, Penny, come over here. What's the matter? Look. Good heavens, he... He's dead. He's not only dead. He's been strangled. Murdered. <laughs> Well, that's a very interesting story, Mr. Kent. I think it answers my question, all right? What do you mean it answers your question? Why, it tells me who murdered Norman Miles. You're crazy. And if you know who murdered him, why don't you tell us? For several reasons, Mr. Kent. In the first place, my purpose in being here is to study the criminal and his reactions while he still believes himself unsuspected. Now that I know his identity, my task is going to be much more interesting. Why, the man's crazy. Well, look here, Danfield. If you really think you know who it is who murdered Uncle Norman, it's your duty to point out the guilty party. No, Mr. Warren, I don't think it is. I'm not a policeman or even a private detective. If I pointed out the guilty party, I would only make things more difficult for the police. Why? Because I have none of the concrete evidence that the police require in order to establish the murderer's guilt. In other words, you can prove nothing. Does that relieve your mind, Miss Nelson? Miss Fairfax, have you your notebook handy? I'm all set. Fine. I'm going to ask three questions. I'd like to have you jot down the answers verbatim. I think the nature of the answers will determine at what point in our investigation we should ask Officer Moriarty on guard outside the house to step inside and make an arrest. Well, how do you like that? This guy kills me. He's going to ask three questions, and bingo, he can prove who the murderer is. Well, I'm not answering any questions. Neither am I. I think you will, because the one who refuses will immediately be taken into custody. Let me see now. Mr. Kent. I believe I'll start with you. Are you quite positive that all the windows and doors in Mr. Miles' bedroom are locked on the inside? Yes, I've already told you that. I checked them myself. You mean you checked all but the window that Miss Nelson opened when the three of you came through the broken down door? Listen, Hawkshaw, if you think that Please, I... Miss Nelson, I'll now ask you your question. Was the window locked when you went to open it? Sure, it was locked. I unlocked it. 
And if you don't believe me, you can look for my fingerprints. You'll find them. Very well. Mr. Warren, have the three of you been separated at any time since you discovered the body? Well, since the others came through with answers, I suppose I'd better. No, we all came downstairs, called the doctor, and then the police. We stayed in this room until they arrived. Excellent. Miss Fairfax, have you got all that down? Verbatim, Dr. Danfield. Thank you. Now, will you please step to the door and ask Officer Moriarty to come inside, please? In a moment, we'll return for the third act of Danger, Dr. Dan Peel. But first... Now for the third act of... Danger, Dr. Dan Peel. Here we are, Miss Fairfax. Well, they certainly demolished the door to Mr. Miles' bedroom, didn't they? Dan, you annoy me. Yes, the lock is sprung. That means the door was locked when the two men broke it down. Giving that big build-up about asking three questions and then not paying at all. Oh, careful when you step into the room, Rusty. You might put a stuck in one of those spunkers. Never mind my stockings. There we were, waiting for Officer Moriarty to make the arrest. And then all you did was borrow his flashlight. These windows are locked exactly as described. Now let's examine the open window. Do you realize what those people downstairs think of you now? They're laughing at you. When this story gets out, your reputation will be ruined. Indeed. Possibly we'd better check the fingerprints on this window lock just to make sure that Miss Nelson was telling us the truth. What's your opinion, Miss Fairfax? My opinion is that we'd better get out of here before we make bigger fools of ourselves than we already have. Well, look here. Look where? Never mind. Your lack of interest in this case surprises me, Rusty. Come along now. No, Dan, wait. I am interested in the case, only... Only what? It's you I'm interested in. You've got such a good reputation. I, I don't want to see it ruined, that's all. Rusty, you're really a very nice person. Come on now, in less than 15 minutes, we'll have found what we're looking for. I promise it. Dan, it's awfully dark out here. I wish Mario were with us. You're not frightened, are you? Is there something to be frightened of? Oh, yes, yes. I have no doubt that someone will attempt to take our lives in a very few minutes. That's a pleasant thought. What's the matter? Look there. Two depressions in the soft earth beneath the window of Mr. Mount's bedroom. Dan, those marks were made by a ladder. Quite right. Then that means that someone put a ladder here last night and climbed up to the... Dan, that window up there is the one that Judith Nelson said she opened. So it is. However, no one climbed up the ladder. What do you mean, no one climbed up the ladder? The marks on the ground, Rusty. They indicate that the ladder was only three feet from the house. If anyone attempted to climb up it, he or she would have fallen over backward. I guess you're right. Then why was the ladder placed against the house at all? Because someone wanted the police to investigate and discover what we've just discovered. But why? Well, because that would lead investigators to think that admission to Mr. Miles' room was not gained via the window above. That doesn't make sense to me. The window was locked anyway. Not then. Well, well, look here. Now what are you looking at? A tree. You notice how that branch extends over the ledge just below the bedroom window? What about it? The window was locked. Dan, what are you going to do? I'm going to climb the tree. You stay here. Dan, no, I'm coming too. Don't be ridiculous. Women aren't supposed to climb trees. Dan, Dan, see them. You come back here. That limb won't hold you. Don't shout so, Miss Fairfax. I don't want to be caught up in this tree. Oh, you don't? Well, how do you think that I... Oh. What is that? Rusty! Rusty! Hey, this limb is breaking. Come down and I'm falling. Rusty! Rusty! Hey! <laughs> Now, just a minute, just a minute, Mr. Officer of the Law. I got to see Dr. Danfield. Well, never mind, don't say it. I'm going to see him just the same. Well, I guess you don't know who I am, eh? Me, I'm Mario Consoletti. You ever hear of me, eh? Well, no. <laughs> you very funny fellow, Mr. Officer of the Law. All you say is, well, well, what's the matter? You don't speak English like me? Well, there you go again. Well, 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 let us... That doc must have get himself in another pickle man. No, no. You stay here, Mr. Officer of the Law. I speak to my... Hey, Doc! Doc, is that you? This is me, Mario, Doc. Mario, da... over here. Hey, what is it? What's going on around here? Who chopped down to that tree? Mario, Dan's under that tree. What's that? The doc are hiding under the tree? What's this all about? 
Mario, Mario, get me out of here. The doctor. Okay, doctor, don't worry. I'll fix you up. <laughs> Be a little careful, Mario. That's all right. It all didn't do me any good. Yeah. You, you fall out of the tree, eh, Doc? <laughs> yeah, very funny. Hey, maybe you got a shot or two. No, 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 I didn't get shot. The branch started to break and he missed. There, I'm all right. Where's Rusty? Dan, over here. Rusty, you all right? Oh, sure, she's all right, Doc. <laughs> when a woman can talk, she's all right. <laughs> now, let's not try to be funny at a time like this, Mario. Is me funny? What happened, Rusty? Somebody came up behind me and hit me. I went out like a light. Yes, and then he shot at me. Well, I saw where he went. Rusty, you go back to the house now. No, like... I'm going with you. Oh, Rusty, sometimes you try me. Well, this is no time to argue. Mario, will you pick up the flashlight? Pick up with the flashlight. Yeah. I got him. Where we go now? Over to that small building behind the garage. Our attacker was heading in that direction. Well, frankly, Mario, I'm glad you happened along. Me happen along? <laughs> That's very funny. I've been looking for you all day. You should not go off without to Mario, Doc, no? Perhaps you're right. Shouldn't we be a little less noisy? If the person we're after is in that building, He isn't he'll... in the building, Miss Fairfax. I'm sure of it. Here we are. Hold that flashlight on the door, Mario. Okay, Doc. Well, that was easy. Throw your flashlight around inside, Mario, will you please? That's fine. Now, follow me. No, no, no. You better let me go first, Doc. If that fellow is here... He isn't here, Mario. I've already told you that. The place is empty, all right. Not quite, Rusty. What do you mean it isn't? This is nothing but a tool shed. Hey, maybe somebody's hiding behind those boxes, huh? There's no one hiding behind the boxes. Well, just as I thought. <laughs> that Doc, he's always a thinking. Yes, that settles it. Come along. We can return to the house now, and this time we can identify our murderer without asking any questions. Well, Judith, where have you been? Out, looking for a man who fell out of a tree. Oh, so you heard it too, huh? You should have seen the expression on Danfield's face when he hit the ground. I did see it. And I saw the expression on your face when you sawed the limb halfway through this afternoon. Snooping again, huh, Judy? Yes, snooping again. And so were you. And so was Larry. By the way, where is Larry? Right here, darling. Do you think I'd try to escape? I would be a sucker to do that, wouldn't I? This is really very amusing. We're all actually suspicious of each other, aren't we? And if you're asking me, that's just what Danfield wants. He thinks the guilty party will break down under the strain of wondering which one of us he's going to put the finger on. You sound worried, Vincent. I suppose by that crack you mean I've got something to worry about. Well, have you? Oh, stop it. None of us killed Uncle Norman. If we keep this up, we'll be at each other's throat. She... She's right, Larry. Sorry I went off the deep end. Sure, okay. Let's forget. Oh, here comes the great man now. Remember, whatever he says, we stick together. Oh, so you're back again, are you, Dan Field? What's it going to be this time, a spelling bee? <laughs> Maybe he's thought up three more questions to ask us. What I want to know is, who's the character you've brought along with you? Uh, she means you, Mario. She means me? Hey, lady, what do you mean by this character, uh, this, this, this name you call Mario? Never mind, Mario. Now, if you have all finished with your remarks, I'll ask Officer Moriarty to arrest the guilty party, and we'll be on our way. Listen to it. What are you going to do this time? Borrow the cop's gun? How about the three questions? Don't we get to answer questions this time? No, Mr. Kent. I can prove you killed your uncle without asking you any more questions. I killed him? Certainly, Mr. Kent. You killed him. I've known it all along, but it's been only within the past five minutes that I've been able to secure enough evidence to establish your guilt definitely. I killed him. <laughs> Vinny, did you hear what that guy said? Yes. I heard him, Larry. Too bad, isn't it, Larry? Why, you... I don't think you'll get much sympathy from your two cousins, Mr. Kent. You see... They've known all along that you were guilty, but they were afraid to... Mario! Don't worry about me, Doc. I'm all ready. You are, eh? Well, how do you like this? <laughs> Funny fellow. <laughs> Why, you want us to know how, how Mario likes it? <laughs> it's really very funny. I like this. True. <laughs> <laughs> In a moment, we return for the conclusion of our story, but first... Now for the conclusion of... Danger, Dr. Danfield. 
Um, new paragraph. I wish to mention that it uh, was through the courtesy of Captain Otis of the police department and the able assistance of Miss Fairfax and Mario that I was availed this opportunity of studying the criminal mind under these circumstances, which... Miss Fairfax, I'm not through. I'll say you're not. And if you don't tell that lecture class of yours how you knew how the murderer got into Norman Miles' room, I'll write it in myself. Miss Fairfax. I mean it. I believe you do. Well, the murderer climbed the tree to the ledge and got in through the window. How could he? The window was locked. Judith Nelson swears she unlocked it when she opened it that morning. Miss Nelson only thought she unlocked the window. What? Yes, you see, Larry Kent had loosened the hasp earlier in the day so that when Mr. Miles locked his window at night, the lever slid over the catch instead of under it. Damn. Then, of course, Mr. Miles didn't lock his window, but thought he had. That's right. Kent later entered the room through the window and strangled his uncle. However, the next day, he had the problem of tightening the hasp without detection. But but you established that all three of the suspects had been together all day. Yes, which meant that Mr. Kent had to wait until nightfall to tighten the hasp back into place and to remove his fingerprints. And it was Kent who shot at you and then ran toward the tool house. Yes, he wanted to return the screwdriver. He didn't want anyone to find out that uh, he tightened the hasp. But how did you know it was Larry Kent? I saw him when I was falling out of the tree. Oh, then you did Oh, know. yes, yes, I did, Miss Fairfax. I knew he was guilty all the time because of my knowledge regarding the workings of the human mind. I see. Uh, Dan. Yes, Rusty? Do you, uh, by any chance, know what I'm thinking of right now? Indeed I do, Rusty. Uh, lift your chin a little higher, please. <laughs> 